Richard Norton Smith, as uh, Marty and Elaine have indicated, is certainly no stranger to this community. For five and a half years, from 1996 to 2001, he served as director here. And people in West Michigan are still talking about it. He's my predecessor at the Howenstein Center. He's the founding director of the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies. And I can tell you, talk about a, a footprint. Uh, people are still talking about all of his achievements when he was here. The fact is, wherever he goes, Richard makes his mark. And that's saying something when you realize that he's the director of more presidential libraries and museums than anybody else on the planet, <laughs> serving as the head of the Lincoln, the Hoover, the Eisenhower, the Ford, and the Reagan libraries. On the way from the airport to the hotel yesterday, I, I asked Richard which one of his posts was the most interesting, which library. Without hesitation, he said, oh, uh, it was working here at the Ford because of the opportunity he had to work with President and Mrs. Ford and their family. And when he's not directing libraries, Richard is a frequent commentator on the news hour with Jim Laird on C-SPAN and on other networks. And when he's not directing libraries and museums or providing commentary to the public, he's writing books, engaging books, about George Washington, Thomas Dewey, and Herman McCormick. What he's currently at work on is a biography of Nelson Rockefeller. He certainly has a strong Ford connection. And when Richard is not directing, comment, commenting, or writing, he is teaching, which is what he presently does at George Mason University in Northern Virginia. And I keep finding myself thinking those lucky students. And You know, there are a lot of presidential junkies out there. They're all over the place. And uh, if we were a tribe, I think Richard would be our chief. <laughs> Last spring, when I first found out about Richard, uh, told me that he had this new post at George Mason. It gave me an idea. I thought, there's no way we can just have him come to Grand Rapids back home and just give one lecture. I said, Richard, would you please give a whole series of lectures? Would you be our Palestine Center scholar in residence for the better part of a week? And I was just delighted that he accepted and will be able to give his greatest hits over the next uh, several days between now and Wednesday evening. I hope you have the opportunity to pick up a schedule uh, on your way out. Well, in this afternoon's talk, Richard poses the question, does character count? Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Richard Norton Smith. Thank you, please. Marty, Elaine. Um, there are worse things to be compared to than a comet. Although, <laughs> I'm not an astrophysicist, but my recollection is that comets are made up of hot gases. <laughs> so, uh, and as far as being the founding director of the Hollenstein uh, Center, that's a pure technicality. I'm sort of the William Henry Harrison of the Hollenstein Center. Uh, Gleaze is, uh, is a man who's really put it on the map and uh, deserves enormous credit. Um, and of course, Ralph, uh, without whom it wouldn't exist and without whom we would not be here. Today, um, it is such a pleasure to be here, particularly on on this day, and, and, and particularly to see so many old friends, beginning with Marty and Sue, and, and my colleagues here at the board, and, and so many folks throughout Grand Rapids and West Michigan. Uh, it is actually a coincidence, I'd like to take credit, but it's a coincidence that I'm here on the day that, that President Ford reaches that uh, remarkable milestone. What is not a coincidence, though, if you stop and think, about maybe some of the unlikely aspects of the Ford legacy. Uh, walking around downtown last night, you know, sometimes you have to go away from a place for a while to come back and see it with fresh eyes. And you know uh, that downtown uh, Grand Rapids has been transformed and uh, really is a role model for a lot of downtowns all over America. Um, that didn't just happen in the last five years. It started almost 30 years ago when President Ford decided not only that he would put his museum in Grand Rapids, but he would put it downtown, hoping that it would be a catalyst, that it would be a seed that would, over time, blossom into exactly what has happened. And um, I know there's a whole lot of other folks, most of whom are named uh, uh, Vinando and DeVos, who had something to do with that, and we're grateful to them. But someone had to begin, and I would argue that it began here. Uh, so we've come full circle in some ways, and there are very few things that would give President Ford as much pleasure as the chance to, to see what's happened uh, at the Grand Rapids. Um, it's true, I believe, asked me uh, coming in, uh, 
you know, I get asked, when you've been associated with as many institutions as I have, people ask you all the time, what was your favorite job? I remember last year, before I left Springfield, uh, I was talking about Bob Dole. He said, well, what next? And I said, well, I don't know. You know, I've been running large and increasingly complex institutions for almost 19 years now. He said, yeah, if you don't stop, you'll wind up in one. <laughs> Gene Kelly used to say that um, he was asked all the time to name his favorite dancing partner. And he says, you know, if, if you're smart, you'll never give him a straight answer. Um, but if all else fails, you can always tell him Fred Astaire. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have no difficulty in, in telling you that um, the board was and is a place that has a very special spot in my heart. Um, certainly because of the relationship that uh, I have with the, with the boards, but with the whole extended board family, and that includes a lot of people in this room as well. Finally, before we get started, uh, it's interesting, I've been teaching, uh, as we've said, first time, um, and uh, enjoying it. Among other things, I've discovered that professors get to ask all the questions <laughs> without having any uh, concurrent responsibility to provide answers. Uh, and that's kind of nice, uh, and we're going to do a little bit of that today. Um, the question of before the house is, does character count? More than 30 years have passed since the day in August 1974 when Gerald and Betty Ford realized that their lives were about to be transformed forever. Alerted to the existence of a so-called smoking gun in the White House tape recordings kept by Richard Nixon, late one night, the then Vice President of the United States did something utterly characteristic. Together with Mrs. Ford, he repeated the words he had learned in a Grand Rapids Sunday school half a century earlier. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. It wasn't the first time Gerald Ford had found solace in those words. As an adolescent, he quoted them on the day he discovered that his stepfather was not his birth father. He turned to them again after escaping death by inches aboard a World War II aircraft carrier in a storm-tossed Pacific. A different kind of storm engulfed him in the strident summer of 1974, one without precedent in American history. To meet it, the new president had only the 25th Amendment to the Constitution to add to the support of Michigan's 5th Congressional District. <coughs> As it turned out, this was not all he had. He had the confidence of virtually everyone with whom he had come into contact during a quarter century on Capitol Hill of Republicans who made him their leader and Democrats who made him their friend. He had the faith and decency instilled in him and his brothers by a remarkable set of parents. Most of all, Gerald Ford had his own integrity, an unshakable optimism, and a governing belief in the inherent goodness of mankind. He had, in short, the mandate of character spelled out nowhere in the Constitution, yet essential to any government built on trust. The men who wrote our national charter fashioned the presidency to fit the contours and character of George Washington, that very human demigod who demonstrated the capacity of men to pursue interests larger than self-interest. In his first inaugural, Washington himself raised the character issue. Quote, there is no truth more thoroughly established, he said, than that there exists an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness, between duty and advantage. The United States, Washington implied, could only flourish as a republic of virtue, her president leading by example, and on occasion using his exalted position to teach, admonish, and publicize. 